Hello Retro Fans! This is repair attempt number 2 of my reloaded MK1 board. You may remember in one of my uh, previous episodes I was uh, trying to bring it back to life and um, I failed and actually it's not clear what the issue is so uh, basically I'm going to have another test or well, whatever session and uh, I have no idea where we're going to end up so and um, to make this a little bit more let's say interesting I decided to combine this with some kind of uh, let's say oscilloscope uh, usage episode and um, in order to have a good let's say start or Yes, at least some, well, let's say knowledge about the status of the ICs I'm going to use. I started to uh, work on um, my reloaded MK2 board and I have used the uh, IC um, set I have used for the reloaded MK1 board already and uh, I was interested in to see whether the ICs are still okay so um, that we do not end up um, checking uh, over and over again a wrong set of ICs or a broken set of ICs and um, in the background I have already started to let uh, check 64 run on the reloaded MK1 uh, MK2 just to see whether those uh, ICs are working fine and as you can see, uh, I'm at uh, count uh, 34, so it runs for quite a while now. And um, except for the PLA, everything appears to be okay. I have used my check uh, 64 uh, diagnostic cartridge uh, because it's not that I don't trust the other one I have used in the previous video, but uh, I have, uh, let's say, more experience or let's say I have more well I don't know confidence in this one because I have used this a couple of times and uh, this has uh, worked quite well and I want to check the other one on the board that's perhaps working so to see if everything is fine so that we do not let's say add too much um, question marks into the whole process and um, as we can see, we have uh, two bad readings uh, on this test, and this is mainly based on the fact that the MK2 is using indeed a different uh, PLA, so it has basically no real PLA. It is some kind of onboard logic included, whatever embedded PLA, and uh, therefore we have a couple of uh, readings which are not as uh, fine or not as good as we would expect is from standard c64 board i was going to use a standard c64 board for this test but uh, i have to uh, repair this first or at least i have to add a couple of uh, sockets but my desoldering gun is kind of um, well i don't blocked or something like this and i have to fix this first and um, before I end up doing a couple of um, other things in front of this one, I decided, well, let's throw the ICs on the MK2 board, let's have a run, see whether they are working or not, and then uh, move them to the MK1. And then uh, we go through the very same test, and uh, hopefully it is uh, perhaps working at the end of the day, I have no idea. But um, on the other side, hopefully it's not working, because I want to demonstrate how we can use an oscilloscope to chase, let's say, some uh, important signals on the board and to see whether uh, this is a signal issue or maybe we can identify some other source of the problem. And in order to do so, we may change the board first. And um, it's a good idea to switch it off. And uh, I have checked the voltage of the power supply as well, and as you can see, the MK1, MK2 is running very well. And we're going to use the very same power source or power of PSU for our test. So I think we are fine there. I 
and obviously we have to take out the ICs we're going to use in order to have common base I was talking about. So. This is kind of a, let's say, test episode as well, because I kind of had to move to Windows 10. And um, I did some, let's say, test recordings. And they, well, kind of worked well. And uh, hopefully I'm not going to experience uh, any major troubles so far. I mean, if we're going to believe in Microsoft, they tell us everything is going to be better with Windows 10. So maybe we have even better results or whatever. Anyway, and um, may have to get out the ICs we are not going to test for today and um, for this we kind of need Obviously the MK2 and the MK1 they are different, so we cannot test all the other ICs, but um, if this session is going to fail as well, then I am I will pick up a 469 board that's working fine, and then we are able to test almost all of the ICs expect for the except for the VSP fix. But I think the color RAM is going to be the same, the 64K RAM is going to be the same, PLA and uh, 8701 clock chip is the same as well, so that we can move all the ICs to a 469 board and see if they work there. And um, if this is not going to provide any interesting results, then I probably give up and uh, send the board back to individual computers so they may help me with this one. And uh, now we just have to pay attention that we're not going to mix up the ICs. And especially that we use the correct alignment. It's a little bit tricky because the CRs are kind of turned around so the text has to be upside down although to have the correct placement and uh, I remember in one of my first videos about the MK2 I think I have used the sockets in the wrong way so I thought I have to place the ICs this way and then I have to kind of open the lever and um, funny fact is that Jens told me that's not going to be the case and I have to use it like this. And um, well, anyway, let's see what's going to happen now. Going to switch this on. Let's have a look at the C64 screen as well. The last time the diagnostic test was running as well, but we got a lot of bad readings, or especially the CRs. And I'm very curious to learn how this is going to end up now. And see the whole screen, but for whatever reason, everything is working fine. And this is, um, well, kind of surprising. 
because I have no idea what we have done in the last video and why is why it wasn't working. And um, anyway, it's a good thing, so we are not going to complain about this too much. And therefore, we can continue with um, our little uh, oscilloscope excourse and uh, see if we can have some learnings from this one. And probably at the end of the video, I'm going to take off the Check64 test cartridge and um, we'll have a look whether the board is working. And then, if so, I have absolutely no idea what went wrong. But anyway, let's move on. And the good thing is that uh, this time I don't have to do that much preparation because someone on the forum 64 with the name Garrett, or at least with the nick Garrett, spent a lot of time and created a fantastic guide of how to use an oscilloscope to measure important signals on the C64 ports. And we're going to use this because it makes absolutely no sense to reinvent the wheel and um, I'm not going to claim this uh, as my work because it's already done by someone and I think we should appreciate this and therefore I'm going to refer to this guide. And um, that's very cool. Just have to pick the window so that I can scroll a little bit. And um, there are some uh, kind of a preamble at the beginning, so we should have at least some knowledge how to use all that stuff. We should have checked a couple of uh, things already, like voltage, the temperature of the ICs, and uh, we should know how to use an oscilloscope. So that's uh, nothing I'm going to cover in this uh, tutorial, but I briefly um, kind of translate and explain what we are talking here right now. And um, for this one, for this uh, tutorial, we're going to use uh, two probes. So we're going to use a two-channel oscilloscope. And um, I'm using this um, O1 uh, XDS2102A. That's a one mega, uh, 100 megahertz, uh, one giga sample, 12-bit uh, digital oscilloscope. Uh, it's well, let's say pretty cheap for the features it offers. It has some kind of flaws here and there, but basically it works pretty good. And especially if we keep in mind that we are not working on high frequency parts, I think this one is more than enough for our exercise. And uh, the two probes are sharing the very same ground, so we just have to ground one probe, which uh, provides kind of a um, freedom of um, movement on the board because by whatever reason those ground connectors are very short and um, I was going to make this a little bit longer but every time I pick it up I just remember I was going to make this a little bit longer so maybe this is going to happen sometimes and most of the time I'm using the cover of the expansion port as my ground because here I have enough of space to connect this uh, clamp to it and uh, it's not going to slip off so quickly. So, and uh, he's stating in the very first part that uh, the first thing is we have to identify whether the reset signal is working. And I just have to check because now we run into the first problem. Uh, but anyway, the reset signal is on pin 40 and uh, it should be low during the switch or during a reset and then it should jump back to high and I'm using this uh, second probe, the blue signal and it's high as we can see and uh, maybe if we switch off the board for a short moment we got a low signal and we have a very brief moment where the signal is low and then it jumps back to high. So this means the CPU is running. So everything's fine. The next thing is we're going to check whether the VIC got his uh, 
clock signals and we have basically two clock signals, the color clock which is 17.73 MHz on the power system and we got a dot clock which is 7.88 MHz and uh, we got those two signals on pin 21 and pin 22 so we're going to have a check here and as we can see we got a signal here that's not really a nice rectangle it's more like a sinus and this uh, looks a little bit different on um, 469 or on, uh, for, on, on original Commodore boards but uh, this signal is absolutely fine and another one uh, is going to be the dot clock which is a little bit lower and as you can see at the left hand bottom we have a frequency uh, counter there as well or a kind of indication and we can see it's 7.8788 something so it's very close to what we are looking for and this is 17.75 or something like this which is very good as well so and the interesting thing is that the WIC is creating the frequency for the CPU as well and uh, this is a good chance to compare those two signals and the CPU uh, signal or the CPU uh, tag is uh, created out of the dot clock and uh, I have uh, the, the trigger set to source uh, 2 which is the blue line so we need to go to our CPU and uh, use this as our clock timing and uh, this is basically on uh, pin 1 of our CPU which is here and now we got sync and it should be an eighth of the dot clock and if we count one two three four uh, for the high part and then we got another four for the low part and that's basically exactly one cycle and uh, we may switch the time base of our oscilloscope as well so that we can see this a little bit better and we may move this to this side as well and then we can count one two three four highs for the high signal and one two three four highs for the low signals so that's exactly one eighth of the dot clot so everything is working fine um, we may move down the yellow line a little bit so that we can see the top of the line the very strong signal what we've got here so far it's really five volts and um, so the clocks are there everything is working fine and um, one one kind of uh, let's say normal failure mode of a c64 board is the so-called black screen and as i said in a, one of the previous videos the black screen is not a no screen. So the black screen means the WIC or at least the modulator is creating some kind of video signal and your video device, whether this is a TFT or a TV set or whatever, is syncing to this, uh, to this uh, video signal. So the board is not dead at all, it just, it's just not showing you something useful. So it got stuck somewhere in the middle. And this is a very good test. If you have um, a black screen, then I expect to see some uh, clock on the wig, but perhaps the CPU is not getting a clock or something like this. And this could mean that uh, some trace is broken or the socket is broken, or perhaps the CPU is broken, something like this, and pulls the signal down or something like this, and it's not creating any content and the wig has no data to show this. So then let's move on to the next one and uh, here uh, he talks about that he's checking the so-called AEC signal that's on pin 5 of the CPU in relation to PHI0 which we have checked right now and um, this puts me a little bit into the problem that we have to move to a different ground location because my cable is too short which reminds me that I want to create a longer cable and uh, for this exercise we're going to cheat a little bit and we're just going to use this clamp 
add this to our expansion port. We just have to take care that we are not going to touch anything on the board with this cable now. And he says we have to use pin 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's one signal, and then we have to use pin 1 again. This one. And they look basically the very same, but there is a little shift between uh, the two signals, and that's absolutely fine. So this is exactly what we have to expect on this uh, position. And if the AEC is uh, zero all the time, which is basically our blue signal, Yes, then um, most likely our CPU is broken. So this is very fine as well. So let's move on and uh, let's see what's going to be the next signal. And then he's going to check uh, the RAMs. And uh, here we have a couple of uh, signals and they have a certain relation to each other. And let's see whether we can see this with our oscilloscope as well. And this time we're going to measure some stuff on our wig. It's going to be pin 18 and pin 19. And we know that our wig has 20 pins on one side. So we know that's these two signals. And um, basically they look very fine as well. We see a certain shift here, which is a what we expected so far. And um, if we go to move on to our RAM, we may see the very same thing. I'm just going to check why we have. So identical signals and uh, pictures are showing that we have Ah, okay, now he's, com he's simply comparing this to whatever signal. Let's have a look. He's not going to explain this. But what we are looking at right now is the picture here, in the left hand bottom corner, and if you overlay the signal we can see, maybe I just change the probes, then we have the very same colors as well. Here we go. And if we move up our signal a little bit, then we have almost the very same picture we can see uh, the blue signal, which is basically our RES signal, is a little bit shorter than the CAS, CAS signal. And uh, that's, this is exactly what we expect. And let's see whether we can reproduce this on our RAM ICs as well. And um, he's saying that this is going to be pin 5. One, two, three, four, five. It's going to be like this. And it looks like we uh, like the signal we saw just a minute ago. And the next one is pin 16. So we know that we have nine pins. It's 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 16. Probably not the night and right one. So I miscounted this a bit. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 16. Well, it is uh, close. Uh, <laughs> it's not very nice, but uh, it looks kind of uh, similar. But there's at least some kind of relation between the signals, as we can see. And uh, the yellow signal is delayed, but what we can see is that we have probably the wrong pin, or 
it's not the right thing we are looking for right now, but uh, comparing the number of on the IC, it's a really, really the correct one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Check the other one. See how this is going to look like. It's very similar. So perhaps on an MK2 board, this or MK1 board, this looks a little bit different. So we may have to compare this with a normal C64 board. But uh, basically the relation of the signals is the very same. It just looks a little bit different. So, and the next thing uh, he is checking whether the ROMs are addressed and if they are working. And this is going to be a little bit tricky on the MK1 because it uses some kind of a combined ROMs for a character basic end kernel. And uh, we have here as well a uh, EEPROM which is able to hold more than one ROM set and uh, therefore we have to kind of skip this. And then he moves on to the CPU and then uh, he is checking whether the CPU has a change of the read-write signal. And uh, we can check this here as well. And this is going to be pin 80, 80, uh, 38. Sorry. And uh, this is high all the time. So... This is interesting because we should see some change, especially in comparison to the PHI0. Ah, we do not have a write cycle all the time. So this could be that we see some occasional flashing. Let's change the trigger source to channel 1. And um, let's do this in a single mode and see whether we can get some change there. Basically, it should trigger on a change, but it's not doing so. Which is indeed a bit strange. Let's move down the line a little bit. Here we have some read write cycles. Okay. So let's see whether we can get the trigger to this point. Move it a little bit to the middle and then we may have some zoom here. And um, this is very close to the picture he's showing. So it differs a little bit, but if we now use pH I zero, which came from, let's check it twice. Going to lose my ground connection. It's already gone. Pin one on the CPU, okay going to be a little bit complicated now, but we'll make, we'll make it. Here we go. So, now we can scroll back to the signal we are going to analyze. And we can see if we have a downward slope, then uh, the yellow signal should rise. And this is what exactly what we can see here. And when the PHI zero is back to high, then our yellow signal should be back to high as well, depending on the length of the read-write cycle. So everything looks fine here as well. And now he's checking the data bus on the CPU. And um, this is going to be very, very erratic because I expect that we have a lot of activities on the CPU and uh, it starts with 
this pin. I just probably bit seven and put bit six, five, four, three, two, one. Oh, I skipped one. Two, one, and this is zero. So what we can see here right now, we have a lot of uh, data activity going on on our CPU. So if we move the trigger a little bit and change this to a mod slope, it's going to be a little bit more stable, but still a bit erratic because it's binary code. So, so far so good. Let's move on to the next thing. The IRQ signal. And um, this is some indicator that some other device or some other IC on the board is demanding some time. And um, this is important that the CPU kind of uh, gets some information and stops doing what it's doing right now and provides this um, to the other devices on the board. And um, this is on pin 3 of our CPU. And uh, this is going to be a little bit complicated because actually we do not have something that's going to trigger an interrupt. Let's change the time scale a little bit. See if we have perhaps some occasional signals. I still assume that our Check 64 still running. Yes, it is. And I expect that this perhaps going to fire some interrupts. We may miss it right now. <laughs> so let's wait a short moment until we may come to the very same point again. Good chance to have some tea. And perhaps we can freeze the oscilloscope for a moment and see whether it is going to get triggered. Here we go. So there's one fantastic looking interrupt signal. Everything is working exactly as we expect this. And uh, this is indeed very nice. So we got this one and then um, there are some general uh, rules of using an oscilloscope and you may have um, recognize that uh, what I'm doing here on this board is a little bit experimental because using probes on a running board has always some risks. I mean on um, a board like this where we have the so-called uh, zero insert force sockets, the SIF sockets, um, here it is a little bit better because we have some kind of uh, gaps in between the pins and if we really um, go into the socket with our probe then um, it is not as likely compared to a standard uh, socket that we kind of uh, shorten some pins. And if we just uh, take one IC for example, let's take one where we can Probably not going to mess up something like this one. And if we press the scope to or our probe to a pin, and then we may slip in between the probes. Usually, this needle is very thin, and it's it's really hard to bridge a tenth inch um, grid pin uh, distance like this. But uh, you may slip little bit uh, to the side and then you bridge two pins 
and this is uh, very likely that uh, you're going to kind of uh, destroy something with this activity and um, it's perhaps not that I see you're going to kill but uh, it is very likely that you are going to well kind of damage something on the board and um, this happened to me and this is a very expensive learning because I killed a MK2 board and I was uh, checking some signals on the week and uh, I kind of connected the, the pin of the I think it was a, a signal line and a power line and this has killed uh, the MK2 board and uh, I still got this in my shelf I really have to send this to individual computers that they have a look whether this can be repaired or not and um, on a standard C64 board you may have to change I don't know one or two ICs or something like this there's not that much uh, stuff you can uh, kill with uh, an activity like this but uh, depending on the pin you're going to short you may kill the IC as well so as I said on SIF socket boards it's a little bit easier and I was really not paying that much attention and I was really pressing the probe against the pin itself and not using this uh, let's uh, call it a little pit in the TIFF socket to get some kind of um, fixed connection so basically if you really have to work with your oscilloscope as well if you have to change some parameters or something like this where you really need um, your hand for this where you really have to pay attention to what you're doing then I highly recommend to use some uh, clamps and um, most of the modern oscilloscope probes they come with a kind of uh, adapter like this one to just put on it. and then you have a very uh, well strong clamp which works very fine for this uh, tenth inch uh, tenth of an inch uh, grid ICs for smaller devices it's going to be a little bit tricky to squeeze this uh, huge thing in between the uh, the pins and for this I'm going to use usually let's have a look if I can find this right now yeah. go I have an, another uh, oscilloscope uh, cable which uh, has some smaller clamps at the end and um, this is a very important as well that you do this when the board is switched off only. So using those clamps bears the very same risk that you're going to shorten some pins and it's really hard to maneuver with a thing like this in between the pins and uh, it's very very likely that you shorten something. So please keep in mind, switch it off, connect your probes switch it on then do on your oscilloscope whatever you have to do and everything will be fine so for the purpose of this exercise i did this kind of on the fly but uh, as i told you i had to pay a lot of attention that i'm not going to slip off and uh, do any things so so much about uh, let's say oscilloscope um, exercise uh, i think it does kind of interesting to see how those signals are generated, how they are related to each other and how to check this quite quickly on a board. And the interesting thing is um, that if you have a kind of modern voltmeter then uh, you do not really have to use an oscilloscope, you can use the voltmeter as well because um, just to detect whether you have a signal or not it is really enough to measure the voltage because if the signal is low you get zero volt it's it's low it's ground but if there is some activity a change between high and low for example then you should measure something in between so it's not going to be five volts it's not going to be zero volt depending on the frequency and uh, the duration of the high signal we will have some readings somewhere I don't know, just a guess, one to three volts or something like this. I mean, it's very hard to capture an interrupt as we have seen here right now. This requires some uh, help of uh, the trigger function of an oscilloscope. This is going to be very complicated with a uh, voltmeter, except you have one that captures the high and low uh, values. And you may see this there as well. And uh, if you have, um, let's say, a 
kind of a bit better uh, voltmeter, you may be able to measure some frequencies. And that's a very good thing about this, uh, let's say, retro computing technology. We do not have that much high frequencies. So the highest frequency we have seen here today was a little bit less than 18 megahertz. And uh, this is just uh, used for the WIC chip. And the difference of the signal was about a little less than 8 megahertz. And uh, this is perhaps a little bit challenging for voltmeter, but at least you can check whether there's a frequency or not. And um, this is basically one thing to start with. And as I said at the very beginning, if this everything is working fine, then let's see whether the board is working without the test cartridge. And if not, then uh, I probably have to go through the very same exercise, which is perhaps not going to be recorded as a live thing, but maybe some key points to have a look at. So, everything is disconnected. And let's see if we have at least a basic screen. Fingers crossed that something is going to happen. And we got a black screen. So Check 64 is not finding any issues. Every signal on the board looks fine, but we still got a black screen. So, then let's have another test, whether we can find what's going on here. And uh, I'm probably going through the very same procedure, because this has been proven as very helpful. So and the very first thing is whether we got our clock chicken signals on our on our wick. The first signal, that's the second signal. And then we have to use this probe for the CPU signal. And this is not triggered, therefore that's a little bit erratic. Combine this. Or change the trigger. That's going to be a little bit easier. Here we go. Oh, this looks fine as well. So then we have AEC on the CPU. And This one we have a small offset. I'm going to use the signal from the wick because my cable is too short. Which kind of reminds me to to link to make the cable longer longer. <laughs> so then we had the RAM and we were expecting on pin 5 a signal. It's there and pin 16. 18, 17, 16. It's there as well. And then we were going to check the read-write signal of the CPU. And this is pin 38. It's going to be this one. And that was the thingy with this complicated trigger. And there's no read-write activity on the CPU. So, CPU probably never started to do something. And I think we skipped one thing and that this was the interrupt test. Or was this a little bit later? Mm, just got confused a little bit. Here we go. IRQ signal. On pin 3. And there's no IRQ. 
but we should see at least 60 IRQs per second from the system timer. And this indicates that there is a connection issue between the SIA and our CPU. But let's see whether we can see this during a reset. Nope. And if we're going to switch this off and on. Go to single again. Nope. Nothing. There is no IRQ at our CPU. And uh, this may have a couple of reasons, but uh, he's pointing to the timer in the CR1. So now we have to look up whether we can find. Let's start with here and see whether we can find the CR chip. And there should be some pin layout. And we are looking for Underwall timer. Let's have a look at the count signal. It's 40, just going to be this one. There's nothing. Time of day signal in 19, this one. Here we have some block, that's fine. And then we have interrupt request, which is on pin 21. There's nothing because we have no keyboard attached. So we may add a keyboard and see whether this is going to change something. And check twenty five, two, three, four, five. We got a clock signal, that's fine as well. Thirty four is going to be the reset. So we see a short signal during reset, that's fine. And chip select till 23. Always high. And read write is always high as well. So it looks like we're still stuck somewhere in the middle of our start procedure, which is usually on the standard C64 board a ROM issue that we cannot read our kernel from the ROM, for example. And this is an explanation why we can start with the check 64 because it's not requiring the ROM. But I think the character ROM is required, otherwise we wouldn't see something. And um, well, as we can see, we're probably not going to solve 
this riddle today. And um, the next thing I have prepared, at least a bit, is going to be a matrix. And uh, I'm just going to show you this briefly. Just need my notebook for this. I have created some kind of a mod spreadsheet with uh, different sets or different cartridges. And I want to write down what's going to be the behavior of these uh, cartridges. And uh, I want to have a deeper look into how those cartridges are working, just to understand uh, which parts of a standard C64 are required to run those cartridges. As we can see, we have the diagnostic cartridge here, for example, we've had a RAM check cartridge, Turbo Chameleon, which is kind of bypassing most of the CPU ROM things on the board, and um, we got some uh, Super Saxon, for, for example, it's a game cartridge that is using bank switching, so it's doing a lot of uh, memory bank switching, and we got, uh, for example, Messiah, which comes with a known ROM set. And uh, this is what I have prepared so far. I haven't started to do so, but uh, that's probably going to be the next exercise. And uh, it looks like we are not going to close the case of this, um, let's call it reluctant uh, MK1 board. I still don't think it's broken. I still believe that there is some uh, kind of uh, contact issue, something like this. Perhaps we really have some issue with one of the sockets or maybe during uh, the change of the ICs uh, something fell into the socket or something like this. So that's going to be a very uh, long and boring exercise to check all the contacts on the board. And um, I will probably record this as well and make a kind of a time-lapse video out of it or something like this. I'm not sure right now, but uh, anyway, we check that at least the ICs are still okay. That's fine. So we haven't killed, or at least I haven't killed all those ICs during the first repair attempt. I mean, we have, <laughs> I haven't even started to repair something. I'm just uh, trying to analyze this. But um, anyway, I hope uh, you had some uh, interesting moments, some learnings as well. And... Um, I'm looking forward to your ideas and uh, comments. I mean, uh, I want to thank all those um, people who had uh, already contributed to uh, the first episode with a lot of ideas. And uh, this has kind of led to this episode. And uh, now we have some more information. And let's see whether this is going to be helpful for solving the issue with this board. So, thank you very much for watching, and um, well, as usual, feel free to uh, subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so. Feel free to support me on the, those different supporting platforms, which I'm going to link in the description section. And um, as usual, I'm looking forward to your comments, and see you for the next episode. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.